what uh, those years meant for some of our protagonists in in our meeting and uh, we are so thankful for you to to be with us today and and sharing your thoughts about uh, this uh, story which is certainly not history it's still here as you know tomorrow um, there will be some entombment in the in what I call the uncivil mountain the valley of the fallen so maybe we want to talk to that about that at the end but first of all 1939 you wrote your first article about the fascist and francoist troops coming into barcelona can, can you tell us what what prompted you to to write that what was the what what did the spanish civil war mean to you and mean to the and to the u.s at that time well this was uh March 1939, uh, shortly after the fall of Barcelona, uh, it was a fourth grade newspaper. Editor and leader, maybe my mother, I'm not sure. And I'm sure the article was not very memorable. Uh, the only thing I remember from it, which has just stuck in my mind for the last 80 years has been the first sentence, which answers your question. The first sentence was uh, Austria falls, Czechoslovakia falls, Toledo falls, now Barcelona falls. And it went on to say something probably not very memorable about the apparently inexorable spread of fascism over Europe. Uh, I was old enough to be able to listen to uh, Hitler's Nuremberg rallies, uh, not understanding the words, but uh, the mood was unmistakable. And I have to say that when I listen these days to uh, President Trump's rallies before his adoring crowd, some very unpleasant memories come back. Uh, uh, fascist symptoms without the ideology. Uh, at the time, 1939, I had been following at a 10-year-old level uh, what was happening in Europe, in particular in Spain, which was a special interest for whatever reason, I don't remember. Uh, shortly after that, in my early teens, I was I lived in Philadelphia, uh, about 100 miles from New York. Uh, there was a train from Philadelphia to New York when I was about 12 years old. My parents allowed me to go by myself to New York to spend the weekend with relatives. And I wanted the uh, anarchist offices and bookstores. Uh, the Freie Arbeiterstimme office was in Union Square down in those days, if any of you know New York, uh, down 4th Avenue, which has since been gentrified. There were lots of secondhand bookstores, uh, many of them, it turned out, uh, run by Spanish emigres, uh, many uh, uh, from anarchist communities. And they were very happy both at the office and in the bookstores to talk to a young teenager who was fascinated by their experiences. I picked up lots of pamphlets. Uh, by now, there, many of them are available, but they weren't available for many years. A lot of liter important literature about the anarchist revolution, uh, about the U.S. role in uh, facilitating the fascist attack, which was suppressed in the press at the time. Uh, also, I was lucky that the main library, the main downtown library in Philadelphia, uh, happened to have a very large collection of uh, left-wing materials of all kinds, and I spent a lot of Saturdays there mulling through all sorts of stuff and learned quite a bit about it that I didn't know at the time I wrote. Uh, so, for example, I, I was unaware reported or denied that uh, the Roosevelt administration was uh, directly involved in supporting the uh, fascist attack later. 
quietly conceded many years later in declassified material, but denied or even disregarded at the time. And I was able to learn something about the uh, experiences in the collectives, uh, so some of the original documents, uh, collectivization documents, uh, studies about uh, Spanish and Catalan, uh, which I could kind of make out more or less, not really knowing the languages of the reports of what was happening. Uh, and uh, it was a major education. So. But at the time, and it, it did seem at the time as if the spread of fascism uh, was unstoppable. Uh, and it was correlated in a way with very local experiences uh, where we, we happen to live in a section of Philadelphia that was mostly uh, Irish, uh, Irish Catholic and uh, German. We were the only Jewish family there. Uh, and the, uh, it was very highly anti-Semitic when the Irish kids came out of the local Jesuit school. Uh, they were raving anti-Semites. You know, took a couple of hours for them to calm down they ball on the streets and that sort of thing. I mean, I can actually remember uh, beer parties when Paris uh, fell uh, rather strikingly on December 7, 1941. All the same people were appearing with uh, tin hats, uh, waving flags, uh, American flags, and telling you to pull down your blinds at night because maybe there'd be a German air raid and that sort of thing. And it turned very quickly. But anyway, the local experiences, in a way, reinforced or gave a personal meaning to the uh, news about uh, the very frightening news about the successes of uh, the fascist uh, uh, war. I, I, of course, didn't know it at the time and hasn't been learned until quite recently. But the American government, it turns out, had the same assessment uh, in uh, 1939. The State Department and the Council on Foreign Relations, which is the major private institution dealing with uh, a lead institution dealing with foreign affairs, uh, set up a program called the War Peace Studies Program, which began from 1939 to 1945, uh, assessing the, the uh, post what the post war world would be. And there turns out in the this early period, 1939 to 42, but roughly, uh, they had the same concerns that I could just pick up as a young teenager. The, uh, uh, they assumed that the, they took for granted that the US would uh, emerge from the war as a world dominant power. Uh, and they uh, laid plans for the post-war world on that basis. Uh, they constructed uh, what was called a grand area, which would which the U.S. would dominate, would include the Western Hemisphere, uh, the former British Empire, which the British would take, the U.S. would take over, and uh, uh, the Far East. Uh, and then there would also be a German run the world, uh, which would include much of uh, Europe and uh, uh, much of uh, Eurasia. Uh, by 19, that was by 1942, 42-43, uh, after the Battle of Stalingrad, and particularly the huge uh, tank battle at Kursk shortly after, uh, it became clear that the Russians were going to defeat the Germans. Uh, and in fact, it's not too well known in the, in the United States, but the Russians fought almost the entire war against the Germans, even right to the end. Uh, they assumed, of course, the plan changed at that time, that uh, there wouldn't be a, a German-held world, but a Russian-dominated part of the world. And the grand area was expanded to include as much of Eurasia as uh, the U.S. and Britain would kind of a client by then, uh, would be able to uh, take over, certainly Western Europe, the industrial heartland of, uh, of Eurasia. Uh, but those were the government, secret government plans at the time. Uh, the, you could sort of make it out 
educational experience. Uh, I must say that I was pretty skeptical about uh, the germ the war against the Germans seemed a war that simply had to be fought. They were horrible beyond words. The war against Japan was a much more mixed affair uh, later, much more about it. It was pretty obvious at the time that the wartime propaganda was highly misleading. Uh, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the wartime propaganda depicted the enemy as the most uh, grotesque villains in human history. But the Japanese were subjected to far more racist propaganda than the Germans. The Germans, which are all the American long hair, good people, kind of like us, who sort of went wrong under Hitler. But the Japanese were absolute vermin. You could just smash and destroy them. In fact, uh, even before the Pearl Harbor, uh, the uh, there were public. It was public in the newspapers, not secret, that the U.S. was uh, shipping uh, B-17s, the big bombers of the day, to uh, Manila, the colony and uh, Vladivostok, to uh, prepare to bomb the what were called the ant heaps, in which the, the Japanese uh, living, so they could be down by. US Air Force. The Japanese could read this in public documents. They didn't need secret. You could read it in the newspapers. Uh, also, the it was obvious enough at the time, the full facts came out later, that the Western empires, mainly the British, but then following them, the Dutch and the French and the US, had closed off uh, the entire imperial system to Japanese competition. Uh, the British were all in favor of free trade. It was clear they were going to win. Uh, but as soon as they couldn't compete with uh, Japanese industrial competition, they simply closed off the empire, uh, followed by the other imperial powers. But uh, Holland ran uh, in the East Indies, uh, United States, the Philippines. They were simply closed to Japan, but they were Japan's uh, markets and uh, sources of raw materials. So it was clear something was going to happen. And what the Japanese, in fact, did, by our standards, it doesn't really amount to much. Uh, the famous day which will live in infamy, December 7, happened to be my 13th birthday. Uh, the, uh, uh, they bombed uh, military bases in, Two U.S. colonies. Okay, not nice, but not the worst crime in human history, considering the background. And then what followed was pretty atrocious. I mean, uh, won't go through it. And meanwhile, uh, about I think forty thousand Spanish refugees fled uh, the hemisphere, mostly to Mexico, but some did come to the United States. Those are the ones I was able to meet and learn from and talk to in New York in the early 1940s. But that's uh, basically the background. If, if I may follow up on, on your um, discussion about the U.S. involvement in, in Asia, there is a um, character in that time which was very close to one of our prominent exiles, Juan Ramon Jimenez, and that was Henry Wallace the vice president, the 1941-45 uh, Roosevelt administration. What, what, what are your thoughts about Henry Wallace? Well, I actually supported him in the 1948 election. He ran as a third party candidate. I thought he was the best of the three. I, support didn't amount to much. I wrote a couple of articles about it. One of them, I should say, Unfortunately, I didn't save, was in Arabic. I was studying Arabic at the time, and I figured I'd try to write a campaign uh, uh, article for Wallace in Arabic. That one never got out of my, in my bedroom, actually, where I was working. But uh, he was, uh, he was uh, undermined by 
uh, Truman and the liberal press. He was in favor of uh, what we now call detente, uh, some steps towards uh, accommodation with the uh, Soviet Union, with China. And uh, he was just ridden out of, uh, uh, he was also kind of a social democrat. He was in favor of uh, domestic, extending the New Deal. He was one of the leading figures of the New Deal, wanted to carry it forward. There was a big attack against labor in the late 40s, very powerful attack. Uh, uh, you know, the class war was on hold during the Second World War, but it broke out very quickly afterwards. There were big strikes and harsh repression and uh, strong legislation. Wallace was uh, one of the few in the administration out of it pretty soon who was opposing this and supporting labor rights and the rights of uh, agricultural workers. He was very interested in agriculture, but he was simply uh, ridden out of the political system very quickly. I, I mean, wanted to... That was uh, the period that's called McCarthyism. Right. McCarthy was the leading figure, but it was actually started by Truman a couple of years earlier with a lot of red baiting efforts in the government to weed out to people who might be sympathetic. Um, Truman himself was a complicated figure. Uh, he happened to love Stalin, uh, Uncle Joe, as he called him. He said he was just like the kind of politician that uh, uh, Truman remembered from his days in, in Missouri and local politics. And good old Uncle Joe was being misled by the Politburo, but if he could get out of those uh, constraints, then he and Truman could get along fine. Uh, Truman added, as long as Truman got his way 80% of the time, uh, would be. Uh, in fact, Truman staff had to uh, silence him to, uh, because of some of the extreme pro Stalin statements he was making. But that was the people, but all, at the same time, Truman initiated. Uh, what became a pretty big red scare picked up later by McCarthy and sort of known under his name. Uh, in the early McCarthy period, he was supported. Uh, he, uh, he, it was only when he made a mistake and turned against uh, people even more powerful than he was that he got smashed. The US Army, they were uh, be before we move on full way into McCarthyism, um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on, on uh, uh, non-intervention in the you know, late 30s and early 1940s. And wh what do you make of that, in particular in connection to how uh, non-intervention worked in the rest of history up to now? Well, non-intervention is a very strange term. <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, Germany and Italy were openly right. uh, involved in arming and even fighting for the uh, fascists. Uh, the communist, the uh, Stalin supported the Republic as long as he thought that uh, he could use, he could uh, make a deal with the West, an anti-fascist deal with the West. When it became clear that that wasn't going to work, he simply pulled out. Uh, took about half the treasury with him. Uh, the West theoretically was committed to non-intervention. What, what that meant in practice was, uh, for just to give you an illustration, uh, an, a small American businessman uh, tried to send some guns to the Republic. Uh, he was sentenced for the crime. He was bitterly condemned by Roosevelt as a traitor violating our non-intervention pledges and so on. At the very same time, the, the Texco Oil Company, which was run by an open fascist, uh, the Texco Oil Company, uh, which had contracts to provide oil to the Republic, switched them uh, to send oil to the fascists. That was the one commodity, crucial commodity that Hitler and Mussolini couldn't provide. So that was quite essential. Uh, this was exposed in the left-wing press in the late 1930s. 
mentioned in the mainstream, but it was officially denied by the government and that ended it. Uh, many years later, it was conceded that it was true. Uh, that has a striking uh, resonance uh, many years later in almost the same way, speaking of non-intervention. In, uh, in Haiti, in 1990, Haiti had its first free election ever. Uh, the election was run by a, won by a, a, a radical priest, a populist priest, uh, Jean-Baptiste Aristide. Uh, it amazed everyone. The U.S. was supporting a candidate who was from the World Bank, had huge resources, all the media, everything else. Uh, nobody could believe, nobody even paid attention to the grassroots organizing that was going on in the slums and the hills. And everyone was shocked when the candidate actually won the election. Well, immediately, uh, preparations began for a coup. Uh, the U.S. made it very clear it was going to support the coup. That was called non-intervention. Uh, seven months later, uh, military coup took place, uh, restored a regime of extreme terror. Uh, Clinton came in at that point and again pursued non-intervention until well, it was really, I mean, I, I visited during the days of the terror. Unbelievable. Awful place I've been there, so people so terrified in my life. But when you were walking around Port-au-Prince, the main city, you could see uh, 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 terminals being built to collect oil. Uh, meanwhile, the CIA was testifying in Congress that uh, the U.S. Uh, policies, boycott policies, had blocked all oil shipments. You could see them there in the city. Well, the, the, the finally, Clinton decided that you know, there had been enough terror and uh, he would send in the Marines to try to impose a kind of a client regime which would be compelled to adopt extremely harsh uh, neoliberal principles, which killed rice production, uh, benefited uh, the rice producers in Arkansas, Tyson, his state, and so on. But he did send in the Marines. Well, when the, it was clear that the Marines were going to come in, it was announced publicly, virtually. So, of course, all the press was uh, looking at the this wonderful humanitarian invention to send the Marines to save the Haitians from the terror that we were supporting. Uh, the day before, I happened to be able at that time to monitor the wires of the Associated Press. You look at those press, stuff is constantly pouring out from all over the world. But they usually have a lead story, and they have a notice to editors saying, this is the lead story for tomorrow. And it keeps repeating, you can't miss it. The lead story was that the US Treasury Department had been authorizing uh, the Texaco oil company to provide oil illegally to the military junta that was carrying out the terror. So I, I was naive. I wrote an article at the time about the marine intervention. And I barely mentioned this. I assumed it would be major news. So there wouldn't be any, this article had come out, you know, seven weeks later. I assumed everybody would know this, so I barely mentioned it. It's totally suppressed. Totally suppressed. To this day, almost nobody knows it. Notice that that's almost a remarkable repetition, uh, even in detail, of what happened in the late 30s. Same oil company same authorization by the government, same denial, same suppression by the media. And uh, actually that's not an unusual case of non-intervention. Non-intervention is usually designed and framed in such a way that it meets policy objectives in one form or another. Right. We're gonna move to McCarthyism. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, to, to, to follow up on, on non-intervention, of course, Spain was not, not the first one to suffer non-invention. It was also Manchuria and uh, Ethiopia, and, and, and actually made of the League of Nations. Uh, 
uh, an organization which was supposed to preserve world peace, but immediately the main actors no, uh, stepped in and decided uh, what, what was world peace in, in their view. Uh, what has changed since uh, that League of Nations into the United Nations and other organizations internationally today? A lot, a lot, of, a lot of names have changed. <laughs> but, uh, if you go back to the early 1930s and the invasion of Ethiopia, uh, the League of Nations did condemn it. The U.S. was not a member of the League, of course. Uh, but you have to remember that even though the League of Nations condemned it, the, uh, the major powers, the United States, Britain, France, they were not very critical of it. In fact, Mussolini was very highly regarded at the time, including by liberal America and Britain even more so. Uh, the British are even more cynical than the Americans when they were running the world. The, uh, uh, Roosevelt, for example, described Mussolini as uh, that admirable Italian gentleman. Uh, made the major uh, uh, business journal, Forbes magazine, monthly, ha uh, had a special uh, issue uh, devoted to Mussolini's achievements and how great they were. Uh, the title of the essay was The Waps Are Unwapping Themselves. The wop is a word like it. So the Waps are unwapping themselves. Finally, the Waps are getting their act together under this group. That was the main business journal. Uh, but the support for Mussolini was quite widespread. And more interestingly, there was support for Hitler. In, the, in Britain, in the, British, in the business community, quite substantially. Uh, same in the United States. In fact, in 1937, the State Department uh, described uh, Hitler as uh, a moderate who is standing between the extremes of right and left. You know, he's holding off the extreme parts of the Nazi movement, and of course, he's smashing the labor unions and the communists and all those bad people. So he's kind of a moderate and we should support him. But this is absolutely standard, right until the present. The worst monsters are moderates as long as we support them. Now, Saddam Hussein was a moderate, strongly supported by the Reagan administration, by the Bush one administration, up until the time when he made a mistake and violated orders. Uh, Suharto of Indonesia, one of the great killers of modern times, very few who match him. He was uh, our kind of guy, as the Clinton administration called him when they invited him to visit Washington in 1995, uh, uh, shortly before he was overthrown. Uh, uh, and it's, it, it's consistent. Uh, actually, uh, the United States had a it didn't have an ambassador in Germany, but it had a consul in Berlin uh, up until Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, the consul was writing back uh, statements to the State Department saying basically uh, we shouldn't be too hard on Hitler. This is after uh, major atrocities. You know, and, uh, we shouldn't be too hard on him. The press is a little too hard on him sometimes. Uh, we should recognize that he has some good sides. His name is George Kennedy, one of the most prominent statesmen of the post-war period, considered a dove uh, thrown out of the Truman administration because he was too soft-hearted. Uh, that was the general attitude. So uh, the fact that there was no serious action taken against the invasion of uh, the uh, uh, invasion of Ethiopia, uh, the uh, uh, Anschluss, uh, uh, the Munich agreements. Uh, actually, Roosevelt sent his leading advisor to Munich, late 1938, Sumner Wells. And Sumner Wells came back from Munich saying, uh, it's a great achievement. We've laid the basis for peace in our time. Uh, uh, this is when 
What's your date? Uh, now we can go forward, you know, everything will be fine. And in fact, if you look at uh, Hitler's takeover of the Sudetenland, it was just, uh, he was just overflowing with uh, humanitarian sentiments. I mean, the goal was to uh, uh, bring uh, this area under the tutelage of the more advanced uh, government of Germany to uh, settle ethnic conflicts, to lay the basis for development and so on. Uh, it's kind of amazing when you look through internal records of the most grotesque regimes and compare them with the internal records of the Western democracies, they're astonishingly similar. So uh, you, know, you look through the whole rich record of uh, uh, discussion of, say, the invasion of Vietnam, uh, the worst crime since the Second World War, there's one theme dominant. Unless you adopt that theme, you're not part of the discussion. Uh, the US is doing everything it's doing with good intentions. It's trying to establish democracy. Maybe it makes mistakes, uh, but nothing could be wrong. We have the highest intentions, uh, developing the countries, bringing freedom and democracy, uh, even when you're wiping them out with uh, B-52 raids on a heavily populated areas, chemical warfare. Crop on. You read the, it uh, uh, happens that the, the Japanese were defeated, so therefore their internal documents were taken over by the West. Uh, the Rand Corporation, which uh, associated with the Air Force, uh, published translations of Japanese counterinsurgency documents, which are extremely interesting. They were released. I wrote about them back in the 1930s, the 1960s, uh, 1966, 67. Uh, the documents are very similar to American counterinsurgency documents at the same time. Uh, the rhetoric. Uh, this is the time when Japan was carrying out the massacre in Nanjing, uh, uh, devastating Manchuria, you know, hideous atrocities all over the place. These are internal discussions of Japanese military officers, diplomatic and military officers. They're not intended as propaganda. They're talking to each other. They're talking about how the Japanese are sacrificing blood and treasure in the interests of the Chinese. Their goal is to bring an earthly par paradise to China, that was the term that was used to protect the poor Chinese people from Chinese bandits and terrorists who were assaulting them. It's just so elevated and first compromise. Uh, and it, I wrote a time pointing out how similar this was to US counterinsurgency. Uh, the article had an interesting fate, my article. Uh, it was almost never mentioned anywhere, but there was one reference to it in the scholarly literature, which cited it as an interesting case of uh, an analyst who was defending the Japanese, defending the Japanese by describing their hideous atrocities. But that's the only way for a Western scholar to interpret the fact that I was comparing Japanese counterinsurgency to US counterinsurgency. How else could you interpret it? <laughs> uh, we, we only have uh, a, f a few minutes, so I, I, I would suggest, uh, uh, in the interest of time, to, to talk a little bit about uh, transition in the, in the 70s, in Iberia in general. I like to think of Iberia, Portugal, and Spain as having interesting uh, situations in, in the 1970s vis-a-vis uh, -vis fascism and, and, and so on, with, with slightly different... Uh, so what, what's, what's your take on those moments? Uh, because we, you know, we only have a few minutes. Well, in Portugal in particular, there was a, a pretty uh, promising uh, uh, left uh, takeover for several years after uh, the uh, Salazar dictatorship was overthrown. No, um, if you move a little bit away from the mic, I think we probably get better oh, hearing. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah. There, there. That better? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were some promising developments in Portugal after the overthrow of the dictatorship. Uh, in Spain, it was a slow process of accommodation. And the I was kind of struck by the long-term effect of the dictatorship. So just to give you some personal examples, in uh, 1990, I spent some time in uh, Catalonia and uh, uh, and uh, uh, other areas of Spain. And I gave uh, talks in Barcelona, for example, where I referred to events of 1936, uh, like uh, you know the attack on the post office, uh, 37 May 37, when the communists, communist-led reaction destroyed the anarchist. So uh, I talked about that and assumed that everybody would know what I'm talking about. And that the only people who understood what I was talking about were people of about my age. You know, younger people had no memory of it. I gave some talks shortly after in Oviedo, and I referred to the uh, 1934 uh, uprising, which was crushed by proto-fascist forces. And again, I didn't give any details. I assume everybody would know all that, of course. Same story. And people my age kind of knew about it. Nobody else. Actually, I found the same thing in Greece about 10 or 15 years after the uh, overthrow of the uh, dictatorship in 1974. Young people just didn't know about it. Uh, I've seen the same in Brazil recently. Uh, young people simply do not know about the military dictatorship. Uh, these things just get somehow effaced from memory under Franco and uh, uh, the, the entire memory of what happened was just wiped out. Uh, it, it takes a long time for people to disentangle themselves from the effect of uh, totalitarian propaganda. And we in People in the West should not be so self-righteous about that. If you ask people in the United States uh, questions about the Vietnam War or the Iraq War or atrocities in Central America, nobody will know what you're talking about. It's, uh, in fact, George Orwell had something to say about this. Uh, everyone has read his animal farm, of course. But not many people have read the uh, preface to Animal Farm because it was not published. It was found many years later in his unpublished papers. Uh, the preface is addressed to the people of England. Uh, and he uh, says basically this book is a satire about the totalitarian enemy. Uh, but in England, free England, he says, I'm quoting now, unpopular ideas can be suppressed without the use of force. A few sentences of explanation. This is one reason is uh, the press is owned by wealthy men who have every interest in not having certain ideas expressed. But beyond that, I think more important, uh, he says, uh, fa a good factor is a good education. If you have a good education, you went to Oxford and Cambridge, uh, you have instilled into you the understanding, the tacit understanding, that there's some things that just wouldn't be to say. Uh, and we can add even to think. Uh, that's basically Gramsci's point. Become so instilled that you can't even think it anymore. Now that's uh, what Orwell called literary censorship in free societies. And there's plenty of examples of it. Uh, from that point of view, uh, <clears throat> I, I sometimes refer to what happened in, in Spain as a number of non-interventions. There was one in 1936, there was one in 1945, and it, to a certain extent there was one in 1977. 1975, 77, after somehow Franco had been gentrified 
as a decent grandfather that could pat on his grandchildren. And eventually, we could come from that uh, dictatorship into a democratic uh, um, uh, period. And indeed, we did. Uh, there, were, there were free elections, and uh, a constitution was written and voted by, by the Spanish people. And of course, you know, we have now an open conflict over the constitution, and one of the areas in which we have that conflict is Catalonia. And my reading would be is that we have two opposing forces, a, 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 conservative, a very conservative, non-moving reading of the constitution, and, and maybe an over-extended uh, uh, reading of uh, demos uh, possibilities from Catalonia onto uh, the rest of Spain. What, what, what do you? What, what are you? What is your reading? All of, all of this. Well, there are a lot of complicated issues involved in the separatist uh, movements. Take, say, Catalonia. Uh, for one thing, it's not really very clear what the majority of the population in Catalonia want. I think there are serious questions about that. The uh, repression of the leaders is. Uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, un totally unacceptable. Uh, the, even to keep people in prison years without charges, gross violation of human rights, the sentencing I th think was far too severe. Uh, but there are issues about separatism which can't be just dismissed. Uh, like for example, in the vote in Canada just a couple of days ago, a uh, Separatist, separatist party in Quebec uh, uh, got lots of votes. Uh, more strikingly, in Western Canada, which is very pretty reactionary, uh, deeply involved in a petroculture, uh, the, uh, uh, they didn't win the vote, the election. They actually had a majority of the vote, but they didn't win the election. There's not talk there about what they call a wet, wet, like uh, separating petro-based Western Canada, rural petro-based Western Canada from uh, more you know, liberal uh, Eastern Canada. Uh, let's talk about that in the United States too. In, in the areas. Well, these are not questions that can be just lightly dismissed. Um, they, they, in fact, do reflect uh, sentiments of significant parts of the population. And uh, when you talk about constitutions, uh, one of the most uh, dramatic examples is, in fact, the United States. Uh, Britain has never had a real constitution. The uh, Constitution of 1689 is you know, a couple of sentences, uh, basically affirming uh, uh, the parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, the British, what's called the British Con Constitution, is a collection of norms, uh, conventions, uh, agreements among the elite sectors who run the country. Uh, Boris Johnson's recent uh, actions are considered scandalous, not because he's violating the Constitution literally, but because he's violating the norms and conventions, which is the first time. Now, take the United States. That, has, of course, has a written Constitution. Uh, in the context of the 18th century, there were elements of the Constitution that were quite progressive. Uh, even a phrase like, we the people, you know, didn't mean a lot in practice, but just to assert it was revolutionary. It was a very flawed document in other respects, but by the standards of the 18th century, pretty progressive. Uh, there's a uh, a, a judicial, uh, the conservatives today in the United States are committed to what they call originalism. Originalism is supposed to mean interpret the Constitution the way the founders thought about it. By today's standards, that is hopelessly reactionary. <laughs> now, why should you look at the world the way some guys in the 18th century looked at it? You know, just we know their beliefs at the time. Uh, but that's, in fact, I, if the United States were to apply for membership in the European Union, it would be turned down by the European Court of Justice. 
לא פשוט, ממש כל המנסים Just one final thought from you. We, we, this morning we remember one of the successors at Bryn Mawr College uh, of Bertrand Russell. It was one of the exiles, Josef Ferrater Mora, Spanish philosopher. What is the outcome for people like you, a peaceful defender of peace in our present and future? What is, I'm sorry, I didn't catch what, 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 what are we looking for for people in the uh, stream of Bertrand Russell and yourself, defenders of peace and dialogue? What is the outcome? Well, I, I don't think we should be looking at, uh, you know, people who are well-known and, uh, and published and so on. We should look at what's happening on the ground. And what's happening on the ground is very exciting. Uh, there's uh, popular movements developing, which are extremely impressive, uh, mostly young people. In fact, you mentioned Sanders, but the, which, who's uh, very respect, I mean, I like him, I think he's doing very good things. But the most important thing that he did, which broke from the political tradition, is to organize a popular movement. In fact, that's why he's despised by the elites. So take a look at this morning's New York Times, for example. Uh, there's an article uh, about how Democrats are concerned that one of their they may not have the right candidate to defeat uh, uh, to defeat Trump in the election, and then they talk about read the article carefully. Talks about why Warren has certain defects, uh, uh, Buttigieg has certain defects, Biden has certain defects. There's one person who's not mentioned, Sanders. The New York Times is not a candidate, uh, literally, even though he's ahead in the polls. Uh, this is standard. And it's not solely because of his policies, which are not all that different from some others. In fact, they wouldn't have surprised Eisenhower, to tell you the truth. Uh, he's an old-fashioned New Dealer. Not so much that. It's that he made a great mistake. He organized a popular movement. That's dangerous. 
uh, once the rabble uh, begin to see that they can do something, you're in trouble. Uh, this goes back to the 17th century uh, uh, English Revolution, I should say, American Revolution, uh, the leading scholarly study of uh, the Constitution, U.S. Constitution, is called the Framers' Coup. By the Framers, the way they carried out a coup against the general population, which wanted more democracy. And they were terrified that popular democracy might take over. So they developed a system which would block it in many ways and would assure, as James Madison put it, uh, that the Constitution would respect, would protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. So people began to recognize their own strength. Uh, Sanders uh, broke that rule, and that's why he's. Uh, out of the, you know, out of the sense. but it's happening, and it's important. Extinction Rebellion, uh, the Sunrise Movement in the United States, uh, the popular movements that swept uh, uh, left liberal candidates into office, Ocasio Cortez and others. These are major developments happening in many places, and I think that's. The Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Sí, esto me acaban de enviar un autobús. Es un minibus. Es venir con nosotros. Ah, se ve.